for you. Good evening, everyone. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit instruct, instructed the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in your consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. Mary, seat of wisdom. St. Eusebius of Vercelli, patron saint of church historians. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I need all the help I can get. So, you know, I'm just... Uh, I, I was just asked before class, uh, Father, you're, you're not going to talk like Father Jerome, are you? I assure you there is only one Father Jerome. I, I did ask for a whiteboard, because every now and then I get inspired, so got to just at least have access to it. So I do want to thank Allison for helping me uh, with all of this and getting started and for flexibility because I know they, it would have been easier just to be up in the church, but again, I, I need, my, need my whiteboard. So, um. <laughs> so, you know, I went to school in St. Louis and the one of the professors, he, he used to love to remind us, you know, what's the big monument in St. Louis that everybody knows? The arch, the arch right? And, you know, they, when they built the arch, they built the arch on both sides upwards. And the, the architects and the, the drafters, the, the construction workers, they knew that if at the base, if they were off by even a centimeter, you know what would have happened, <laughs> right? Instead of, you know. So this professor always would say, begin well, right? Begin right, otherwise you'll get, <laughs> so, so today's kind of our, we gotta get, get the foundation. Um, I, I'm hoping at least, I, yeah, of course, all of you, most, all, all of you are going to know this. Uh, who can tell me the, the first name of our current bishop? David. David, okay, good work. Thank you on behalf of Bishop Malloy. Um, of course, most practicing Catholics know the first name of their bishop, right? Mass every Sunday, we hear it. So, five years ago, I was in Paris, and... Uh, God bless her, I took my mother, and we, the day we landed, first, one of the first things I wanted to do after checking into our, the, our hotel rooms was I wanted to see the cathedral, Notre Dame. And so we, you know, we get on the metro, right, it's French for metro, and we, we get to, to Notre Dame, and I see on, on one of the big doors, there was a poster advertising a performance of Mozart's Requiem. Mm -hmm. Now, those of you who have traveled, you know, you know what happens usually when you travel and you see a poster like that. You look at the dates and you go, oh, it's the day after I leave, right? Or it was yesterday and I just, you know, that kind of a thing. But I get closer to the sign, nope, it's, it's tomorrow night. And I, I made a beeline for their little gift shop, and you know, I'm and like in my very broken, I'm like, oh, the coast out of Mozart. I'm like, yeah, I'm like just like trying to like you know, spit out the French to you know, and I, I go, do you, do you have any tickets? Said, we, you know, so she doesn't have any tickets. So the next day we get in line, and it's it's out the door, and there were there's kind of a, a group of people in line with us, and the one man. He and I both spoke English and French, and so our conversation, I don't know if you've ever heard two, um, two people that speak English and Spanish at the same time, and you just kind of, you know, I knew a guy who always used to love to say, Sierra la window, está frío in here. <laughs> right, close, close the window, it's cold in here, uh, right. And so our, our you know, like we're, we're weaving in and out, uh, you know, English and, and French. For English. For, for English, yeah, franglais, yeah. Um, and then it hits me, I, 
I hadn't said mass there yet in, in, in France, in Paris. And of course, I need to know the name of the bishop. And so I ask him, I go, Como s'appelle l'évêque de, de l'archdiocèse de, de Paris? You know, what's, what's the name of the archbishop? The man couldn't tell me. Now, he could tell me he had lived all his life a block away from that cathedral. <laughs> and he was fascinating to talk to because you can imagine he lived near that cathedral. So he could say, oh yeah, that's Saint so-and-so and that's Saint so-and-so and these are all the Old Testament prophets and those are like, he, I mean, he knew all of it. And, and yet he didn't know the name of the current bishop. And as we're talking, we're talking, and it finally, it finally hit me. He views this cathedral the way I look at an ancient Roman temple. Right? I've been to Rome. I ride the bus. And, you know, when you ride the bus in Rome, you see, oh yeah, there's that little little temple to Apollo, you know, a couple columns, a little roof. I don't see it as a threat, right? I don't feel the need to knock it down, but does it have any relevance for my life? Does it? A temple to Apollo? No. No. And it finally hit me. St. John Paul II often would use the term, he would say, Sadly, we are living in a post-Christian society. And I never knew what that meant until I met that Parisian man. So I finally figured it out. That to him, church history was something that had come and gone and had no bearing on his life. That is the dead opposite of what we are going to be doing in this class. Okay? So instead of the Temple of Apollo, I give you a better image. Uh, who's been to Rome? Couple, God bless Father Kotnik. <laughs> Wait, keep your hand up if you went without Father Kotnik. <laughs> oh, wow, okay. I went twice. Imp yeah, twice, okay, sure, yeah. So, so you've, you've been to St. Peter's, right? Yes. You, you went to Rome without St. Peter's, get out of this classroom. <laughs> Um, right. The, the symbolism, I, you know, in English we always call it St. Peter's Square, only of course what shape is it? Right. Now, there's, there's a lot of different symbols there, right? You know, I, I always make a point when, whenever I go there, you know, it's like, like this. I know what you're thinking. Why didn't Father become an artist? I, I know, I know. God has a plan. I don't know. Um, but even, even if, you know, my, my hotel's here, and it would be easy, like the first time I go uh, on a specific trip, it, even it might be easier just to go this way, how do I go? You got to do this, right? Now why? Security. Security. I'm... I've, I've been early enough when, there, when you didn't have to go through the metal detector to St. Peter's. Perspective. Huh? Perspective. Perspective, right? So what's one of the theories on why it was designed like that? Open the arms. The arms of the mother, yeah. right? You walk in and, and it's, he, he made it feel like you're being hugged, right? And you've got this huge church in front of you and you're being, you know, the arms, right? There's another reason that Bernini built the, the square, the piazza, as a circle. Anybody else know? Endless? Huh? Endless? Good guess. Part, probably. I wouldn't say no. <laughs> Give you a hint. What's the other big circular structure in Rome? The Colosseum. The Colosseum. Right? Place the place of death, the place of martyrdom. Right? And so there, there are theories, 
that Bernini was saying to the pilgrim, when you stand in St. Peter's circular square, you're in the ring now, right? Who's, who's up on the top of the columns all looking down? Saints. The saints, right? Who would have been looking down at you if you were in the, in the Colosseum? The emperor and the pagans, right, cheering your death, yeah. right? So Bernini was saying, it, it, he, he was having the saints say to us, as it were, we were in the ring. You're in the ring now. And, and we're cheering you. We're not cheering your defeat like, like our defeat was cheered. We're cheering you on to victory, right? So... As we hear in the letter to the, to the Hebrews, right, we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, so let us run patiently the race, right? So, of course, we're going to go through church history, and as we know, we are a church of sinners, right? We're a church without sin, but we are a church of sinners, right? Isn't that beautiful distinction? Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, church history is the history of saints, right? So we're going to... We're going to be a part of this. So, uh, so yeah, so I guess I, I kind of wanted to set up the lens of when, when we read the story, it's, it's my story, it's your story. Okay? Sound good? Okay. Um, as well, I, I don't think I need to say this. I have, in previous classes uh, in other parishes, I've had to say this. Uh, we are coming from the, the presumption that the church that our Lord founded is the Catholic Church. Okay? Um, if, if anyone wishes to dispute that, if you question that, that's okay, but in this class we're going to presume that that is the case. Questions are always welcome. Uh, I may not have an answer. I may have an answer. I just love the... There was that one priest who said, anybody, you can ask me anything and I will have an answer. <laughs> Whether it's a right one. <laughs> um, we are what we have always been. A community of disciples of Christ gathered together with Our Lady around St. Peter whether it was the original 12 or the billions now, that hasn't changed, right? I love Pope Benedict XVI. Oh, incidentally, I, you know the Myers-Briggs? Have you yeah. heard it? Okay, I'll just, I'm gonna be honest. So mine, mine is ISTJ. Um, uh, Mrs. Bachland, your son, Father Jonathan Buckland, don't mean to, everyone stare at her and make her feel uncomfortable, no. Um, her, her son is an ESTJ. The whole family is. Uh, of course they are. Um, I mean, of course they are. No. Uh, but he, uh, we, when we figured this out, we joked, I, I said to, to Father Buckland, I said, oh, so I can trust you to say what I'm thinking. Um, incidentally, other famous ISTJs, uh, Johnny Carson, uh, St. Thomas the Apostle. I don't know how they figured that one out, but when I read it, I'm like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to own it because here we are. Uh, and, and Pope Benedict XVI. So I, I finally figured out the reasons why when I read his writing, because I go, oh, makes so much sense, right? Because we think alike. So he, oh, sorry, him. Yeah. I am not as smart as these folks. What You're good. What is ISTJ? Like, yeah, what did you say? So, we don't know this. sure, there's a, there's a, a personality test. It's, it's popular in the corporate world called, called Myers-Briggs. And there's, I'm trying to think the other, so there's your E, S, or was it N? N. F. F and P, there it is, yeah. So I struggle with ENFPs because they're the dead opposite of me, right? Notice. So there's a test um, you take? You, yeah, you can take a test. It's, it, it's, um, there, there are many of them online, if that's a possibility. I, so 
I is for introvert, U is for extrovert. S is for sensing, N is for intuit. T is for thinking, F is for feeling, J is for judging, and P is for perceiving. So it's, yeah. Um, that explains a lot. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, I, Father 20, ironically, I, although he and I get along quite well, he's an ENFP. Uh, and he, he loves this, the Myers-Briggs, and he can kind of, he'll, he'll meet somebody and he'll be like, oh yeah, he's a this, right? He can kind of figure it all out. And he, when he found out that I was an ISTJ, he goes, oh yeah, the ISTJ is the one that's likely to not like the Myers-Briggs. <laughs> so, question? Well, I got a neighbor that moved in. Oh yeah. She was very bright and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Sure. I'm, I'm glad to know. Um, okay, so my fellow, my fellow ISTJ, Pope Benedict XVI, he, he set up, basically in response to my Parisian friend and, and people like him, he set up a pontifical council for the new evangelization. Right, because what... What I encountered with that man in Paris, again, good man, right, no judgment, um, that, that is the person that needs new evangelization, right? It's, it's not like he's never heard of Jesus. He's just given up, right? So when Pope Benedict formed this group to, to explore how are we going to do this as a universal church, he, he gave them a bit of a pep talk, and I sort of small quote here from him and it's uh forgive me if i choke it's, it's one of, it's it's a favorite of mine it's very beautiful um he says proclaiming jesus christ to be the only savior of the world is today more complex than it was in the past but our task remains identical to that at the dawn of our history the mission has not changed. Just as the enthusiasm and courage that moved the apostles and first disciples must not change. The Holy Spirit, which prompted them to open the doors and made evangelizers of them, is the same spirit which today moves the church to a renewed proclamation of hope for the people of our time. He goes on, there is a dynamic continuity between the proclamation of the first disciples and ours. Uh, do we need to pick it apart? Are we? There is a dynamic continuity between the proclamation of the first disciples and ours. So if you think, okay, what's, what's my job as a Christian? It's the same job that St. Peter had at the end of Pentecost, opening that door of the upper room. No more, no less, right? I, I love the phrase, dynamic continuity. Because I, we need both, right? Um, I have met many, many a fellow Christian, and they have all the dynamism, but what don't they have? Continuity, right? They don't have the riches that we've inherited as Catholics, right? That our ancestors have handed on to us. Um, the sad part, right? I've met many of my fellow Catholics who have all the continuity, and what don't they have? The dynamism, right? You need them both, right? I, I can hear the Pope. You need them both, come on, right? Could you give an example of that? Okay. 
few years ago, my parish had towed us to us. So that you have the, the college students come in and do kind of a week-long camp for our young people. And they conclude every night with the church's official night prayer. Right? They pray a psalm, and then they sing the Salve Regina, the Hail Holy Queen. Okay? And um, I, I told them that a thousand years ago, some monks were all having bad dreams. And they went to their superior and they said, Father Abbott, we're all having bad dreams. And what was scary was they all had the same bad dream. How often does that happen, right? And the, the abbot said, that's it from now on, we're gonna sing this, the Hail Holy Queen to Mary, and then uh, each of you are gonna, you're gonna line up, and I'm gonna sprinkle you with holy water before you go to bed, and then you're gonna go to your, to your bed and sleep. And what do you think happened? No more nightmares. So I told the students that story, and the next night, one of the students came up to me and said, Father, I hadn't been sleeping well, and last night was amazing. I slept so well that I had never, like I had never been before. Damn it, continuity. Does that make sense? No? So it's, there's a certain power to the fact that we are still here, that there, there is a, our, our job is the job of St. Peter. Right. Okay. Um, we can chat more afterwards. So we also have to get into a little bit of ecclesiology. I know it's a scary word. Don't be scared. I'll help you. So when we say something is ecclesiastical, what do we mean? Church related, right? So ecclesiology is the branch of theology that tries to. Gee, threw another L there. No, there we go. I, I, I had a professor once who was Latino, and he. He was writing the word Christ on, on the board, and he went. And he goes, um, in English, you put an H in there somewhere. And he just walked <laughs> away. <laughs> um, so before we get into the actual story of the church, oh, thanks, Allison. We, we've got to kind of ask the question, what is the church? Right? And she goes by a variety of names. Now, why do, you, why do you think I call the church a she? Bride of, Christ. Bride of Christ. Beautiful. Thank you. I did once ask a group of people and they didn't know. So nice job. Yes, she is the Bride of Christ. Whose bride is she also? Yours. Mine. Yeah. So, she also goes by there was a, a phrase that we, had, we kind of took from the Old Testament also, so some continuity there. Uh, the people of God, right? Um, also the mystical body of Christ. Um, I love that, you know, the thing about a mystical body, our, my, my good friend Pope Pius XII points out, he says there's two kinds of bodies that we can look at. And the mystical body of Jesus is neither of them, but if we look at both of them, they can help us figure out what the mystical body is. Okay? So there's the physical body, right? I have a body, you have a body. Okay. Now, obviously, our bodies, each of us has only one body, right? So there is a unity there. Um, but does, 
Can the big toe tell the brain what to do? No. 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 Right. It's the other way around. Right. right. The, so the toe is utterly at the brain's mercy. Now, is that the mystical body of Christ? Who wants to be a big toe? Right. Better than some other body parts. I'll give you that. So, so, yeah, so not quite that. Now, the other body is a social body. So if we decide, hey, let's form the... The, the beekeepers of Crystal Lake Club, right? Now, obviously, each member retains their independence, right, which is nice. But is there real unity there? In thought. In thought, yes. But if all the members say, hey, we're done now, is there still a body called the beekeepers of East Dubuque? Or of, of <laughs> East Dubuque. Crystal Lake. I always I, I had a friend a brother priest who he he had he he had to be chaplain of everything like he would just you know oh fight there's a you know like every every group imaginable he was like oh I'm chaplain to that oh I'm chaplain to that I'm cha and so I I just like I came up with him like oh yeah you know Bill you're you're the chaplain of the beekeepers of East Dubuque <laughs> so that's that's why that's in my head I was never assigned to East Dubuque so it's not it's not not like that anyway. Um, but there's, there's something lacking in that unity, right? So in a sense, we almost have to put the two together to make sense of us being the mystical body of Christ. Kind of with me? Right. Um, remember, in seminary, this is an entire semester. So, and I've got another half hour. So just, you know, um, if it's not totally easily made sense of that's okay. okay. Little it's good good to pop a brain cell every now and then, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Or get a headache. Um, Pope Benedict's fa favorite line was the church is a communion of persons. Right? He he thought the phrase communion of persons brought together the image of the people of God and the mystical body of Christ. Put them together. Um, when, when we say the Apostles' Creed, remember when we say, how, do, how does it go? I believe in the Holy Spirit. The Lord Apostles' Creed. The Holy Catholic Church. Awesome. So next time you pray the Apostles' Creed, in your head, Add the phrase, before the phrase communion of saints, add the phrase, which is. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, which is the communion of saints. And I also believe in the forgiveness of sins. Okay. So they're, they're, not, they, they're not different things. The one describes the other. Okay. Um, I... When, when I was in seminary, Cardinal Burke was the Archbishop of St. Louis there, and when he would do baptismal vows, he would often go, do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of, like, then he would deliberately put them together like that, so that was how, how the early Christians saw it. Um, I, with communion of saints, I think we can add Dare I say it, the amazing race. Right? We have the cloud of witnesses at the finish line cheering us on as we run. Right? If you can't tell one of my favorite feast days of the year, all saints. Uh, so back to the Nicene Creed, the church has four marks. Nice. These are things that, these are marks that the church possesses, and yet also they are challenges, right? 
I knew, I, when I was at Catholic U as an undergrad, it's in DC, and there was a, I was a first semester freshman, and I had this, this guy that lived across the hall from me, and a few days in, you know, we'd, we'd gone to mass in the, the local church, and he said, he goes, whoa, I never knew black Catholics existed. And I just kind of, yeah, you know. <laughs> and and I, I became a server, an altar server at the National Shrine, you know, the gigantic church, if you've been there. And of course, one of my first days, uh, the, the lady that lectured was African American. And so, like, you know, we, you know, hi Sally, you know, we chat. And, and I told her the story. And of course, beautifully, what does she say? She goes, honey, it's a universal church. <laughs> right? So if there were a group of people that, that, that none of them are Catholics, in a sense, we need to grow in universality. Right? If two Catholics are fighting, what do they need to grow in? Holiness. Holiness. Of the four, though. Oh, the other, I was thinking unity, but yeah, good, good work. Um, if, if someone believes but is ashamed of the faith, of the four, apostolicity, right? Um, so you get what I mean? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I love the, the catechism talks about, you know, I love the, there was a, a girl that had never heard about Christ from China. And she was, someone was telling her about all the different Christian groups in the United States, the thousands that claim to be, that, that all are sincere followers of Christ. And you know what the girl's response was? Well, wait. I thought you only said you said there was only one Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. So the the Catechism calls it wounds to unity. It's, it's a wound of our unity, right? Doesn't mean we don't have it, right? We do have. We we are one church. The unity is wounded. Okay, so I wish I had a holy card for the question I'm about to ask. Um, I know all of you are way too young to remember the Baltimore Catechism. <laughs> the church has, it was blue. That's a good, oh. Did you ever open it? You just saw the cover that was blue. Sorry. The first five questions. Nice. I, I'm always fascinated. The, the last question is the one that I, no one seems to remember. And the ironic thing is, you know what the, you know what the question is? What must always be remembered? Oh. <laughs> or so, like, you know, what must you always remember? Um, why did God make you? No, sorry. Why? God made me to know him, to love him, to serve him in this world, and live him forever in the next, right? Okay. So the church has four marks, right? And the marks, the marks are ultimately visible, right? You can see there's only one pope. You can see that we have missionaries, we are apostolic. You can see that uh, we, we have saints, we are holy. Um, again, even that though, catechism says, we are a holy church, but we are also on a journey to holiness. Right? I know there's, at least a, I can point out a couple of saints here. I won't single you out for the sake of, uh, you, you, you deny it, but um, the rest of us are on a journey to holiness. So, in addition to the marks, there are three attributes of the church, and those are less, less visible. And if I had a holy card, I would definitely give them to the person that could tell me the three attributes of the church. <laughs> well, you've, you've got a collection. <laughs> there. I, we're okay, Faye. It's fine. I, I'm, I'm just, I was just kind of, you know, I know it's a hard question. Faith, hope, and charity. Good guess. The virtues, yeah. A. Oh, mm -hmm. Angelic. Angelic. <laughs> Authority. 
so authority is kind of a positive word, right? It's the fact that when, when we listen to the church, we know that Christ is speaking through her to us. Tradition. Right? Good guess. The other, so the, the, other, the second one is kind of the more negative, right? Infallibility. Um, right? To be fallible is to, uh, to make a verbal error, right? So it's not infallible, right? Not. Uh, and then the third is my absolute favorite, indefectibility. She will continue until the end of time. Right, my, I, I came in contact with the church's indefectibility when I was uh, in my second year of priesthood. The other priest in the house was incredibly dynamic, ridiculously talented, um, and uh, he decided to run away from the priesthood. And suddenly, all of his, the ministries that he, had to, that he was in charge of, uh, guess who suddenly was thrown into those? Hi. Right. Um, but I, I felt a deep peace knowing that the church is indefectible. Right? You know, we're, in, we're, we're down to our 260-something pope. Right? I, I remember when John Paul II died. Uh, please don't roll your eyes and yell about how young I am. I was in college. Thank you. <laughs> Other places were like, oh, you're so young. Like, yes, I know I'm young. Get over it. Um, but I, I remember people being really, really nervous. Oh, I, I wonder who, who's going to be the next pope. Who's going to be the next pope? Who, you know, and of course, I had a friend who was getting his doctorate in, of course, I erased it, in church history that was the one that said, we've been doing this for 2,000 years. We're going to be okay. Indefectible. Um, okay, moving along. I, first classes, I always write way too many notes, so I'm going to have to kind of scroll down. We're going to end on time, I promise. I believe in timeliness. Why were they nervous? I, well, I, I think part of it was was that, that the Catholics that were my age at that time had never seen a papal election before, right? So John Paul II was the only pope we'd ever known. And so that was kind of a, it was totally new and, and that, that I think that was probably the big, the big reason. So, um, so, yeah, so indefectibility. Now, when did church history begin? Hmm? Whoa. <laughs> You're ahead of me. Do you, we want to switch? You can finish? Okay, she was, the church was born. There was a feast where I knew one priest would always make the people stand up. I won't do that to you. Once a year, there was one feast where the people would, the people priest would make the people stand up and turn around and look at each other and sing happy birthday. Pentecost. Pentecost. Now, we're Catholics, we're pro-life. That was the birth of the church. But when does life really begin? Conception, right. So, theologians love to fight verbally, right? The same, the same priest that misspelled Christ's name, he, he used to, he loved to point out that in, in academic and theological circles, you know, you get a group of these, you know, these talking heads together and they, they all have papers to present, you know, and, and they, will, they will verbally, like, kill each other. 
you know, well, Father Smith clearly does not understand a thing of what he's talking about because blah, blah, like, you know, and of course, what are they doing after that discussion? Having They're having coffee. They're saying that's a, that, well, well, Bill, that was a great one, right? You know, so they, they fight like that. They, you know, they leave it on the court. But they love to fight over, okay, so Pentecost is the birthday. We have a couple of vying events for when she might have been conceived. Right, what happened before Pentecost, right before Pentecost? Peter. The Ascension, right. What did, what did Jesus say at the Ascension? Go out into all the world and make disciples. Here we are, right. Uh, what came out of Christ's side? Blood and water, right? So, if the blood and water, if, if blood and water are each a sacrament, what sacraments are they? Yeah. Baptism and Holy, Holy Communion, right? St. Alphonsus loved to point out, in a sense, the two, the blood and water, are all seven sacraments because baptism is the first sacrament and the Eucharist is the greatest. So in a sense, it, it, in between baptism and the Eucharist, all of the other, the other five are contained. So in a sense, you could say, right, what makes us Catholics, what brings us into the church, baptism, baptism began there. Okay, so could that be, could that be it? Uh, you mentioned the commissioning of St. Peter, right? You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my, right? So was... Is he building his church then? Our Lord's gathering of the disciples, right? Um, there is, again, dynamic continuity. When two or three people go into the adoration chapel, how different is that than our Lord talking to Peter, James, and John? Not at all, right? So, when he gathered his disciples, that, that was the beginning of the church. Could the Annunciation be the conception of the church? Why? Could get, uh, huh? Conception of Jesus, and we are the... Mystical body of Christ, right? Okay. That's another. Um, of course, I, I'm, I'm going to try to avoid getting moralistic, right? I, I don't want to throw eight million thou shalt nots and thou shalt, right? Because I figure church history is going to be fun. Um, but the, one of the big moral implications for the mystical body of Christ, right? St. Teresa of Avila, Christ has no hands but yours. He has no voice, but you're right. That's the other to remember with the mystical body. So, yeah, so we, in a sense, we were conceived in the womb of Our Lady. Um, is this mind blowing? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, now, the church is the bride of Christ. What was the first marriage? in human history. Adam and Eve. Right? Heaven, in the book of Revelation, heaven is a wedding feast. Right? Do you think that when God made Adam and Eve, did he was he was he picturing the wedding feast? I think so. Why wouldn't he? Right? He knew everything, knows everything. Um so could the church have been conceived with Adam and Eve? Yes. Possibly. And yet Sorry, I get flared up. <laughs> and yet, why did God create Adam and Eve? Because the Trinity. Right? The three persons, I, I don't mean to sound banal, but the, the three persons 
love each other so much and in a sense we're having so much fun right if you've ever been to a party and you're saying oh the party's so great i wish so and so was here right adam and eve were created to to, to join the party so in a sense the beginning of the church begins with the trinity itself totally crazy no 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 yeah um Notice, to be a theologian, you kind of have to be a bit of a poet, right? <coughs> Got to be, be willing to go through metaphors and stretch a bit. Oh, okay. Is Adam and Eve a metaphor? Um, whether the first human beings were specifically named Adam and Eve, I'm not going to die on that hill, necessarily. Yeah. I, I, will, I will say... The first human beings disobeyed God and thus caused the majority, if not all, of our problems. Um. Why is it that the mm -hmm. woman it was made from the um, rib of the man? The rib of the man. Right. Our Jewish friends love to fight, <laughs> as do theologians, right? I, you know. Um. They, they love to point out, and I think even St. Augustine, one of our great theologians, points this out, that um, why, if, ladies, would you, would you love to hear that the first woman was taken from man's toe? <laughs> How many would want that honor? Right, where the husband could look at his wife and go, oh, you, you, yeah, you were taken from my feet. And, uh, raise your hand, ladies. How many of you like it? Oh, no, hold them up. I need to count. Right. Okay. Um, so, so not, not the foot. Right. So, so as to think, the woman is subordinate. Also, notice, not the head. Right. If. If the woman was taken from the head, then it was it would have been insubordinate the other way, right? Um, so the side was that they would be equal, right? Is it the right side or the left side? <laughs> that you're going to have to ask Eve when you know. Um, right, and of course I you know. They, we, we love to assume for a while that, that, man, that men, men had one rib fewer than women. Mm -hmm. And of course, we, we perform surgery, and what do we figure out? Mm -hmm. It's the no, same. It's yeah. um, From there. I, <laughs> I love the fact that... Um, was my train of thought? It was your fault. I know. No, what do you, no, you're fine. You're fine. What are we going to do? Um, Adam and Eve. Ribs. Oh, yes, I've got it. Okay. So, so notice, God creates all the animals for the man. And the man still isn't happy. Right? Um, how many people nowadays are even subconsciously or per perhaps even consciously <coughs> opting, opting to substitute having actual children for pets, pets, pets. right? They're even using language, mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm, there, there was a woman holding a sign at a marathon, um, or she, I think she like wore it on her back kind of thing, and she said, um, my, my cat needs a new cat dad. <laughs> right? She was looking for a boyfriend, right? Or a husband, I, you know, she was look, looking for, for a mate. Um, but yeah, like to use parental language with, with animals, I mean, I, it's it's not mortal sin to do that. I I don't. I'm not. But like, I mean, are, are we equating the one with the other? I I think we're getting close to it, and I, yeah. I don't like that. Um, but.
But so, yeah, so notice that Adam, Adam looked around at all the animals and went, I, I don't see one like me, right? Um, so a little bit of apologetics, or we could call it kind of secular history, right? Let's step into just for one wild moment. If, if a non-Christian wanted to deny the resurrection, what sort of arguments might he or she put forth? Um, I've got four here, and if you have another, please let me know, okay? My four are the apostles stole the body at night. Okay. Uh, oh, he wasn't really dead. It was just a coma. And of course, these are things that people have asserted. I, I, not, not that I am, obviously. Um, oh, he wasn't really crucified. Just somebody that looked a lot like him. That's, that's incidentally in the Quran. Um, and so kind of similar to the still in the, still in the body at night, the apostles just lied. They made it up. Okay. Other objections? It was all a think? conspiracy. Apostles lied? Yeah. Okay. So we got, we got that already. Are there any that I, I didn't say that you can think of? Oh, I've got one. Hallucination. I forgot about hallucination. Hmm? Hmm? Okay, so now, now we're going to answer these things, right? And you are, uh, you, you sure you, you just want to, like, because, I mean, you're, you're, you're anticipating me. Um, if we were all on some mind-altering substance right now, would we all see the same thing? No. 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 So the hallucination thing doesn't work, right? Scientifically, it can't work. Okay, so we got that one out of the way. Um, uh, what, what about this body double thing? What, how do we answer that it was somebody that looked a lot like Jesus? Good guess. Who also was, was on Calvary? Do you think a mother would be like, oh, that's my boy, when it's not? Yeah. I, I think she could tell. She was I mean, okay, does, does anybody, is anybody the parent of twins here? Identical twins? Because I would think even parents of identical twins would be able to say, oh, no, you're, you're not Joe, you're Jim, right? Um, like, okay, so coma? Blood and water, good. I, I was just going to say more generically, these people knew death, right? Um, right, mortality, right, average life expectancy, much lower than ours now, right? I always, I, one thing I always find mind-blowing, the, the average age of the person that heard the Sermon on the Mount for the first time, 15. That was, that was the age of most people at the time of our Lord. Jesus was doing youth ministry. Right? Someone, when I, I once told that story, someone said to me, oh, that explains why when our Lord goes, oh, do I need to explain it again? Right? Like, you, you know. Um, why he's, right. Um. You know, the, the oh, let's see, what else do we have? Oh, they stole the body at night. Why would they die? How could they steal the body? There were two soldiers there. There were guards. Yes, there were two guards. What's the penalty for a Roman soldier falling asleep? Death. 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 Right? And 
we also know in those days, if when the, the, the high priest, the chief priests came to Pilate and said, well, you, you know, he said he was going to rise. They might try some funny business, right? So he installed two guards. Now, most likely in ancient Rome, you know, they also would have done. They would have hung a sign, just a little, little rope with a little, little flap. And you know what the flap said? Break this under penalty of death. So even if the guards were asleep and somebody just went, in a court of law, they could have been executed for, just for that. So stealing the body, okay. Um, and then, of course, the ultimate... They died. Um, we have a friend named Josephus. What is so special about Josephus? Anybody know? He's a he's, he's historian. He's Jewish. Did he ever become a Christian? No. So he didn't, he didn't have a bias towards us, right? He tells us a number of things. He says, Pilate had been a governor before. Right? We know there was a Pilate. Um, he was governor of a place before he was in Judea. I'll give you a clue. There's a mountain in Switzerland called Mount Pilatus. Okay? Uh, that governorship failed miserably. So they said, we will give you one more chance. Where'd they send him? Here you go. Right? Notice all the stories of, oh, he feared a riot. Yeah, scared, yeah. Right? He had one more chance, right? He couldn't, couldn't blow this one, right? So had to do that. That explains so much. Mm -hmm. That bit of information. True. Mm -hmm. um, so Josephus adds, there, there was a man named Jesus from Nazareth of course, who amassed followers. Um, did Josephus say, oh, he died peacefully in his bed? No. How did he die? He was crucified. Again, a non-Christian is asserting he was crucified. Uh, he asserts also that the followers, what do the followers say about him? He rose from the dead. And he also admits that the followers died proclaiming the truth. Right. So again, these, these are not articles of faith. These are simple historical facts mm -hmm. verified by a non-Christian. So. Pretty rock solid. Um, couple more things, and then I will set you free. Um, Two little stories. I was telling our middle schoolers on retreat about this. There was a 12-year-old girl named Severa that was walking the streets. So this was um, in the first 300 years up to 313. And she was walking the streets and a bunch of people, other kids surrounded her and started making fun of her and bullying her. And you know what she did? She went... And they said, what the, are you doing? And she said, I worship a God who loves me so much that he died on a cross for me. Your opinions of me do not matter. Sign of the cross is nothing new. It just got bigger. Severo? Saint Severo. Um, for confirmation, did anyone take the patron saint of athletes? My son did. Yeah? Sebastian, right? So he was a, he was a soldier and uh, he refused to sacrifice to the emperor. Right? Remember, most of our, of our fellow Christians, they, they were not killed specifically for who they worshipped. 
right? Because in, in ancient Rome, there were many gods, and so you, you could worship whoever you wanted to. What was the problem? You had to worship the emperor, and if you didn't worship the emperor, you were killed, right? Um, I think it was St. Justin the Martyr who said, they, he, he went before the emperor and said, uh, the emperor said, you know, why, why can't you just pray to me? Right? You know what he said? I, I thought it was a beautiful line. They said, your majesty, we will always pray for you, but we could never pray to you. Right? Um, I, he, he goes a bit longer. He'll say, like, we, you know, we, we pray that you always may be victorious over your enemies and that you may rule a peaceful empire. Like, you know, more, more like that, you know, more, more poetic. So, okay, so Sebastian refused to sacrifice. And what do they do to him? Hmm? Oh, we need to practice our archery. You're getting ahead of me, yes. <laughs> they thought he died. Oh, he was in a coma. And they threw him. <laughs> yes, he was. He was. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't quite know. Um, they threw him in a sewer. Now, to me, this is just as heroic as martyrdom. There was a woman named Saint, if she did nothing else, she, she, she got her saint medal for this. She went into the sewer and fished him out. Oh my. And pulled out the arrows and nursed him back to health. Wow. Now, yes. The A that he lived, yeah. And B that she went into the sewer. Yeah. <laughs> so she fished him out, got, got him back to health. Now, I don't know about you, if I was given a second chance like that, I'm going up to Milan. <laughs> Maybe even that island way up there that you know, seems on the edge of the earth called Britannia, right? Also known as Britain, right, England. Uh, no, what does Sebastian do? He goes back into the city and waits till a festival where the emperor is on parade. <laughs> and as the emperor passes by, you know what he says? <laughs> you thought you killed me. <laughs> I'm back. Which to me, ironically, he is not only the patron saint of sports, he's also the patron saint of trash talking. <laughs> Because I may, I. But why wouldn't he be? I mean, that, that's that to me. That's the epitome of trash talking. I, <laughs> holy stupidity. So then, then he was, and did not recover from that. Irene, Saint Irene. Yeah, the the first Saint Irene, yeah. She, uh, the yeah, the Greek, yeah, of course, the Greek word for, for peace is irini, which is where we get our word Irene. So she was, so her, her name would literally be holy peace. Um, okay, so we are almost done. Uh, as in homilies, I always give homework. I will not quiz. I will not put people on the spot and go, did you do your homework? Uh, two, two practices. So there are 16 chapters, yes. 16 chapters and eight classes. So two chapters a class. Um, so today, I just kind of wanted to, to lay the foundation. So, you know, what the church is, why, why we're here. And so the dream would be if you could, um, 
at least maybe skim possibly through the first four chapters. Um, again, I'm not, no pop quizzes, right. Uh, one, one thing that I've found kind of an interesting way to go through, I, I tend to be more of a cut to the chase guy than a let's, let's linger guy. I go to the end of the chapter and go to the discussion questions and I would try to figure out, okay, what, what the answers are. you know, figure out what the answers are and then go, you know, as it were, cheat, go to the, you know, go back into the chapter. Um, so that's one, one request. The other, another quick story. So in the early church, again, being a Christian was punishable by death. So every, every group that gathered for Mass had to have, they always called him a doorkeeper or a porter. Really, he was a bodyguard, right? And so the bodyguard would stand at the door, and if he knew you, he would just let you in, right? And if he did not know you, he would crack the door, you know, picture him looking at you. And so, like, if you know, if you were traveling, right? I always love it, you know, my, I was looking at a college in Rhode Island, and so I, we flew out there, and my mother asked for, do you have a, a worship directory of, of nearby uh, religious services? And the front desk guy just went, oh, sure, you know, and he, you know, hit print or, you know, brought a sheet out. And it was a list of, of Catholic masses. Now, I mean, I was not ordained, so I, I was dressed like you are. And my mother said to the guy, how did you know we were Catholic? It was, it was all masses. And he said, you know what he said? Catholics are the only ones that ask. <laughs> we can be proud of that. So, so, you know, you're traveling, you go to mass somewhere else. Well, you got to deal with the bodyguard, right? Bodyguard opens the door. And he says to you, he goes, in, in of course, local language, he would say, Esne Christianus? Are you a Christian? And you would say, Sixum, yes, I am, right? And then he would say, Da Symbolon, give the symbol, give the password. And you know what the password was? Credo in Deum, Patrum Omnipotentem, Creatorum Celi, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of Heaven and Earth. So your homework, in addition, is daily just to spend a minute or two picturing yourself in that situation, having to cross the bodyguard and give that password to get into the church. The long version or the short? <laughs> the short. The short's the older version. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The Apostles' Creed, not the. Right, the, the Nicene's the... Yeah, and it has to be in Latin, too. No. <laughs> no. Um, okay, so quick, quick recap. Um, dynamic continuity, right? Same church. And that's awesome that it's the same church. Um, the roots, the beginning of church history, right? The mystery of the beginning of church history. Um, and yeah, the daily creed. The creed is who we are. Um, okay. Uh, let me share with you, I want to share with you the three prayers that I pray after I study every day. Um, I figure the first, they're little prayers, don't worry. Uh, the first prayer is thanking God for what he's given me and especially given me the mind and the beautiful ideas that he's put into my head. And the second prayer is, I always figure... You know, St. Paul, for example, right, he, he had to, to, to make a living by making tents, right? So he still had to make tents and then kind of on the side preach the gospel, right? So I think of all the people that enable me to make the priesthood a full-time job. That's all of you, right? Um, 
So I say a little prayer for all those who have done good for me. Okay. Now, maybe in your case, uh, you've, you've had to make sacrifices to spend this evening. Right? So thank you for coming. Um, but you know, if there was someone that you had to say, no, I, I, I can't watch that movie with you tonight, right? so maybe pray for that person. Um, whoever's, you know, um, you know, babysitting and you know those kinds of things. Whatever, uh, wh whoever helped you get here, um, and then also for the grace to uh, to say both both speak and do what I learned. Those are my three. Okay, let's pray. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We give you thanks, Almighty God, for all your benefits. You who live and reign forever and ever. And pay back, O Lord, all those who have done good to us for the sake of your name, and give them heaven besides. Amen. Amen. And Lord, may everything we say and do begin with your inspiration and continue with your saving help through Christ our Lord. Amen. And by the prayers of St. Thomas, may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. See you next week.